Hi everyone, and uh, how was your B1? I don't actually want you to discuss it, but I just hope you went okay. Now uh, we're going to do the C1 required practicals. I will also upload some questions. Uh, the, the few practicals here, I'm going to just talk to them really quickly. And like I said before, I don't want to waste your time. So I'm just going to go straight into it. The very first one, as you can see, is on the first, very first slide, which is making salts. These are the list of equipment you need. Basically, uh, these equipment are quite uh, popular. Just the conical flask is the one I need to point out. The conical flask is used for a purpose so that you know it doesn't spill. That's why we use the conical flask. All the others are quite familiar to students. The method, use dilute sulfuric acid, place acid in a beaker, warm the acid, add copper oxide in small amounts. Copper oxide is a black uh, powder. Now you keep adding and stirring until you, you, you have uh, some that are not dissolved. The whole reason is so that you can be sure that all of the sulfuric acid has fully reacted. So likely question, they could ask you about the safety precautions. Wear goggles. You need the heat proof mat under the Bernstein burner and acid can be corrosive. If you since it's dilute hydrochloric acid or dilute sulfuric acid, it's still very, it could still be corrosive or it could uh, cause irritation. So be careful. And then they could ask, why do you need to keep adding black copper oxide powder? I've explained it to make sure that all the acid has reacted. And then why do you allow all the liquid to evaporate on, why don't you allow all the liquid to evaporate on the flame? Uh, so that you can obtain crystals that are large enough because if you then allow it to cool on the side then you're sure that you have proper crystal and then when it's if it dries on the fire it can start to spill out and that's not safe so the next one is um, electrolysis uh, definition of electrolysis is simply uh, the process of using electricity to split up compounds The materials need that 0.5 molecular uh, mole of um, copper, two chloride solutions, sodium chloride solution, and uh, copper sulfate solution, sodium sulfate solution. Am I repeating myself? The petri dish lid with port holes because you're going to put the electrodes through it. By the way, the electrodes are, are two of them. Those are the cathode, which is the negative one, and the anode that is the positive one. And obviously, you need the low power voltage voltage will help you uh, split the um, compound into its uh, components i thought i'll pour this picture there if you want to pause it and look at it then please do so a few notes the positive copper two ion uh, copper two ions from the copper sulfate and the hydrogen ions from the water are attracted to the negative cathode. So the positive ions after uh, electrolysis are, are attracted to the opposite cathode because cathode is negative and the negative ions are attracted to the positive. So uh, for those of you that are doing the high and the chemistry, you need to know your half equations. My videos are really targeted at foundation. Those who are doing foundation, they are the ones I do my last minute.com revision for. Because the re simple reason is because People who are doing higher or people who are doing triple, they kind of get a lot of help from school. So I try to focus on uh, give, helping those who do not get as much help. So just look at that slide and um, you'll be able to follow. So at the positive anode, the, the hydrox hydroxy uh, ion from the water and chlorine um, ion from the copper chloride are attracted. Only the chlorine ion is discharged uh, here in large in reasonable quantities. Chloride ions are oxidized by electron loss to form chlorine gas at the positive electron, which is the anode. That's an equation that explains it. This is an oxidation reaction because the chloride ions lose electrons and they become oxidized to form chlorine molecules. So at the end, copper is deposited at the cathode while chlorine gas is produced at the anode. 
to test for this chlorine gas, I thought I'd just pop it here. You add it to litmus paper and it will turn a damp blue to litmus paper red and then to white. And I've put in bracket, it bleaches damp litmus paper. That's easy for you to remember. Whilst I was preparing it, I thought to myself, I'll just pop in uh, some other test for halite. The bromy water test, uh, test, sorry. If you add some to an alkane in a test tube, there will be no color change. Alkanes don't react with bromine water because alkanes are saturated, but alkanes will. So if you shake an alkane with bromine water, it will change its color from orange to clear. Some more questions I pulled up from the test book. You say, which of the following ions would move to the anode and which will move to the cathode during electro electrolysis? I actually saw one of these questions on the past paper I was doing to the student today. So it's important to know all the positive ones migrate to the cathode or the negative ions migrate to the anode. Another one, two students investigated electrolysis of copper sulfate solution. When copper, copper sulfate solution is ele electrolyzed, copper is produced at the negative electrode. What substance is produced at the positive electrode when copper sulfate solution is electrolyzed? It is oxygen, oxygen that comes from the water that in the copper sulfate was dissolved into make a solution. This is another question, an investigation into the electro, uh, electrolyte sulfate solution was carried, copper sulfate solution was carried out as shown below. <clears throat> it identifies the two electrodes, the positive and the negative, and the solution. Let's look at one question or so. So a few questions actually, what is an electrolyte that is substance that's been split up and at the negative electrode, a solid is formed, that is actually copper and the gas collected is um, oxygen because it is from the original compound. Because the original compound in this electrolysis experiment was actually copper sulfate solution, that's copper sulfate dissolved. This question says, so just why the blue color of copper sulfate becomes pale, paler during the investigation? It is because the copper ions are being removed. So you get because copper ion is what makes it uh, have the color in the first instance. Article number 10, this is to investigate the temperature changes when an acid is neutralized by an alkali. So you need two more dilute hydrochloric acid, sodium hydroxide solution, expanded polystyrene of 250 centimeters cubic, 10 centimeters cubic, measuring cylinder, 50 centimeters to measuring cylinder, and you need a thermometer as well. The method, use the 50 centimeters cube measuring cylinder to put 30 centimeters cube of hydrochloric acid into the polystyrene cup. Now you stand it in a beaker so that it will not be shaky. Then use the thermometer to measure the temperature of the acid. This has to do with exothermic and endothermic reaction. This is an exothermic reaction. When you then put the five centimeters cube of sodium hydroxide solution into the 10 centimeters measuring cube and then add to the sodium hydroxide eventually, you fit the lid and gently stir it and then you measure the temperature. You repeat these steps and add further five centimeters cube amounts of sodium hydroxide to the cup. A total of 40 centimeters cube needs to be added. Then you calculate the mean maximum temperature reached for each of the sodium hydroxide I thought I'd pop this graph there for you to see and um, how the results would look like. So it's highest temperature uh, against the volume of sodium hydroxide solution added. The variables here, the independent variable, the different volume of um, sodium hydroxide solution, the dependent variable is the temperature change and the constant is the volume of acid base. The safety precaution, again, you must remember that where goggles Dilute to the hydrochloric acid could be um, a diluted to concentration. Practical number 11 to investigate into how the concentration of a solution affects the rate of the chemical reaction. I put here the disappearing cross experiment. Yes, it's one of my favorites. So, because you put a cross on the table and then you put your sodium thiosulfate solution into the cup and then you, you, put, you add the acid to it and start the timer. You should see the cross disappear. That means that the uh, uh, precipitate has formed. <laughs> so that's an exciting experiment. 
So the thing about this um, experiment, when you then, uh, if you look at what I've already said, if you go to point one, two, three, four, if you put the, the 10 centimeters cube of dilute hydrochloric acid into the 10 centimeters measuring cylinder, you put this acid into the flask. At the same time, swirl the flask gently. It's already, it's already got the sodium sulfate in it. You start the clock at the same time. And you look through the top of the flask. Stop the clock when you can no longer see the cross. And I wrote, voila, it disappeared. It's one of my favorite practices, actually. Take care to avoid breathing in any sulfur dioxide fumes. Repeat steps one to five, four times. But in step one, use 20 centimeters cube of sodium thiosulfate plus 30 centimeters cube of water. Concentration 16 grams per dm cube. And then go through the steps like that. You repeat the, for each one and you calculate the mean for each concentration. Now, when you're making the concentration weaker and weaker, what's actually happening, you would see that the, uh, the, it will be taking longer for each to disappear. If you were increasing, because some experiment, they will ask you to gradually increase the concentration of the sodium thiosulfate. You will see that it will be getting quicker and quicker for the cross to disappear. So the whole idea is about concentration affecting the rate of reaction. The higher the concentration, the faster the rate of reaction. I thought I'll pop that um, diagram there, just to uh, because one, once you show students, they always remember it, especially if they've had an opportunity to do it in class. Now, when I read, I pulled this from uh, online. When I read it, I, I saw they made it, you know, it's not really a, a big a mistake. They just, when they were explaining in the last, in the bottom paragraph, said the higher the concentration, the short is the time. They, made, they meant the shorter the time is taking for the yellow uh, uh, substance to form. Yeah, so it's just a little blip there. It's not, I didn't put it, I didn't do this particular part. I just thought I'll put a graph to show you what the graph could look like. So if you find it in exam, you know how to use it to um, answer questions. Graph questions and data questions are usually very easy. Never leave them untouched in exam. Then neutralization and titration. This is for higher and triple. I thought I'll just keep up with it. Uh, because it's one of them, that's why I said I'll add it. So I'm not going to waste much time. If you're doing triple or higher, please pause it and look at it. You should be okay with your titration uh, uh, practical anyway. So you need to understand the explanation of the methods. Please pause it to read it. So these are the steps for titration. Please, again, you can pause the video if you need to see it clearly. Just to remind yourself, breathe. And then, you know, that minuscule, I told I'll put a little picture to remind you that little line that you need to read it also, not the size, so you can read it, read it more accurately. Obviously, that is uh, what a basic diagram of it would look like. And there you go, that's it. Um, I wish you luck with it. Uh, like I said before, I'm going to upload some questions um, tonight as soon as I can finish it off. I'm just trying to put lots and lots. Well, yeah, good luck with it then.